I got stuff for you. Holy moly. I need to get some snakes and release them around my house. Uh, but I love eating people. I love eating kids. These guys are the scientists of the supernatural, lecturers leaving lessons for inquiring laymen. They are applying the scientific method to a world that baffles science. They are the cryptids of the corn. corn, corn. Every day that you open your mouth, I know, right? I'm more convinced that you're abducted by aliens. <laughs> no. And it just stood up. I mean, it just like kept going and going. And she goes, what the? These are idiots. I was laughing reading this because I already knew how you would feel. Idiot. What part <laughs> of the story fits your balloon? Well, this isn't a yeah. UFO. But who else has big black wings and red eyes? Um, Batman. Well, Mothman. Oh, yeah, Mothman. Well, everyone, I think we know exactly what it is. So say it all with me. It was the Sandhill Crane. Would you try it? No. You wouldn't eat it? No. Why? Because they're probably toxic. There'd be a lot of poop in my pants. <laughs> <laughs> Seen a six-foot alligator go swinging through the air and slam into a tree. Your microphone is moving on its own. Welcome back to Cryptids of the Corn podcast. I am the great and powerful... Mystery. And I'm J Clone 96. And you sound normal today. Why well, don't uh, I, you know what? I need somebody do this at home for me. I need like a cape. I want a cape, but I want it specifically made out of tardigrades. They would be all connected like those little mon- b- b- monkeys in a barrel. Mm-hmm. Okay. That way I would be bulletproof, gamma ray proof, magic proof. Magic? Uh, I don't think tardigrades are impervious to magic. They actually are. They're one of those animals. There's just there's very few animals that are impervious to magic: salamanders mm. and tardigrades. Mm. Who would win in a fight? Tardigrades. I don't know. But they wouldn't fight. They're peaceful beings by nature. But salamanders aren't. What? Since when? They are not peaceful. Yeah. They are not. Don't let them fool you. <laughs> so I'm not sure if today's episode will be a two parter or a one parter. We're just going to start working through it and. We'll take a break about the hour mark. Crikey, what are we going to be speaking about today? Well, that doesn't give it away whatsoever. They're going to hate me <laughs> for doing that. You know how I do an Australian accent, though? I immediately just think of Steve Irwin and think of what he would say and then just imitate that. That's Or Crocodile Dundee. Very Two very strong and different Australian accents. Yep. It's a huge work. country, which will be a big talking point today. That's not a knife. The Australian rainforest, rainforest says, and the paranormal that comes with them. Ooh, there's paranormal in the rainforest, eh? Yeah, these are these are scary, weird places. Interesting. Uh, before we get into the science side of the episode, so the first part will be all science, the back part will be all paranormal. Uh, there'll be a lot of overlap. Some of the little comments I want to bring to the forefront is some of the highest levels of venomous and poisonous animals per square meter <laughs> of both plants and animals on the planet is in the Australian rainforest, depending on which rainforest you're in. Interesting. These are also the most under-researched rainforest and forest on the planet. Mm-hmm. Now, I bet people didn't know that. Yeah. You know why? Because everything you touch will kill you. Right. Yeah, exactly. No, it's there's a lot of spiders, a lot of dangerous spiders. Snakes, probably. A lot of snakes. Like, like they don't have a lot of the medium venomous snakes like we do here in the States. It's just all going to kill you. A lot of our venomous snakes in North America will be like, it's going to suck, mm-hmm. but you're probably going to live. Like being bit by a bullet ant. Yeah, just really going to suck. <laughs> I don't know why that was my comparison or reference, but uh, it, it was, all right? And then my last little thing before we really start tearing into this stuff is that most people do not realize this. The movie Fern Gully is about the Australian rainforest. Wow. I did not know that. And, and I love that movie. And I, me, me and Atlas, my baby, were watching it the other day. And I'm thinking, like, I love this movie, Fern Gully. I wonder which rainforest it is, though. Two seconds and a kangaroo hops around. I'm like, oh, <laughs> so Australian rainforest. Wait, do the guys that, like the, what is it? No, nope, they're American loggers. Ah. 
Yep. How does that work? Uh, Oh, contracted. They're contracted in. All right. It's probably an American logging company. Makes sense. Which is, we'll end on this. We'll end this episode all about Fern Gully. The last probably hour of this episode will be just about Fern Gully. This, just this episode? Whatever, these, these, the series of episodes that's coming out about the Australian rainforest. Gotcha. Will be just about Fern Gully. Because there's a lot of paranormal stuff that really does try to tie in a lot of the Aboriginal stuff. Yeah. Uh, that I think, you know, as, for a film of its time, they did a good job. You know, it could obviously be a lot more present, but the Will of the Wisp or, you know, St. Elmo's Fire and all this stuff. Right, yeah. Is common in the Australian rainforest. Okay. People see lights in these forests just. I'm trying to remember if this is the movie. I, I feel like I'm getting it mixed up with Pocahontas a little bit, but you know that big gnarled tree that they're going to cut down? Yeah, that's. Is there a face in that one? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. He, they, they trapped him in. He's the embodiment of pollution and destruction. In the tree? Yeah, yes. The the Fae trapped him in the tree, a life source. Oh, you're right. You no, know, I've I've watched the movie hundreds of times. It's been a while for me. It's been I just a long time. I watched it a while. couple weeks ago. Yeah. But yeah, so basically they trap him. And then when they cut it, they release him. Yeah. Ah. And then he, you know, he gains power off of the old style of pollution, but humans were so nice because the all this new, new modern pollution. pollution. Yeah. Which is mobile. That's why oh. he starts riding the giant those log cutting trees machines yeah. are real and they're terrifying things. Oh yeah, I've they seen them. Eat, like I've seen them eat orangutans and stuff like that. Oh Sumatra. my gosh! Because the orangutans will just sit there and they'll like start hitting them and stuff, and then they'll just and get eaten up. Just chew it right up, yeah. Because they don't know what you, it don't know you're uh, you're there trying to defend its home. Right? Yeah. Well, I mean, the machine doesn't know. The machine I mean, the just people like, driving the machine definitely know they ran over an oh, orangutan. Oh gotcha. Yes, yes. I'm just saying, like the machine itself. They knew. Yes, for sure. But like the, that's how like machinery works and stuff does not care if anything's in the way. A machine's going to do what it's meant to do. It pulleys change whatever. It's it's going to run you through it. Does not matter. Especially a machine that is literally eating trees that are you yeah, know, ten feet in diameter. Meant to do that. Yeah. <laughs> an orangutan or an okapi or something ain't going to put up much of a fight. Not at all. You're pretty <laughs> pretty soft. Yeah. Now before we really get into this, we're going to have a word from our sponsor. So you talk for just a second while I get stuff queued up. Well, our sponsor is brought to you by Flavors of the Forest and their product, Bigfoot Breath, which is garlic powder and salt. Suey! I got me this hot, fresh squonk steak, but man, it tastes bad. Jay, you got anything to fix this up? I think you need some season on that squonk fixer up. Well, what do you got? How about you try this right here? It's called Bigfoot Breath, raw garlic seasoning made from fresh Garlic. Uh, give me that. That's right, that's right, that's right. Well, that did make it taste a lot better. Mm, Jeez. Brank brought that squonk right alive, didn't it? You know, I'm going to have to kill more squonks to use more of this seasoning. Oh, how about you try this instead? How about you try my spicy garlic seasoning? Oh, give it here. <laughs> Suey! That's good stuff. Spicy, but not too spicy. That's perfect. Just Where a- can you get these delicacies? Oh, you can find these on flavorsforest.com. This is our newest uh, spice that's just been created, and it's from Flavors of the Forest. Make sure you all get some at the links down below. We'll catch you. See Ah, that just, um, just sounds delicious. I want that squonk. Oh, gosh. I love them every time I hear them. All right. So the Australian rainforest. Total employment in the forestry, in, uh, or total employment in the forestry and logging in Australia is thousands of people a year since 1984. That's a little fact that'll come back later. Okay, so there's thousands of people employed to work in Just the- cutting down the forest. Oh, okay. Don't. This episode has a sad ending. Just so everybody For knows. For who? Uh, us you, as a as a whole earth. Okay. Uh, it's kind of just one of those hits. It's basically Fern Gully. This is all about the movie Fern Gully. <laughs> uh, but it's real. It's real. <laughs> Australia oh. has many forests that are important due to their significant features, despite being on this dis- or what is considered a desert continent. That's kind of the weird thing. We talked about it early on when we've done other Australian episodes, mm-hmm. is that a lot of non-Australian people have the idea that the outback is the whole country. Right. That it's just one big red desert. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not. There's, it's tens, a- there's tons of temperate forest, rainforest, 
uh, grasslands, shrublands, river bell. You know, there's tons and tons of all kinds of amazing different habitats. That's why they have such a variety of animals, both, you know, mammal, reptile, fish, all this stuff. Marsupial. Marsupial. As of 2009, Australia has approximately 147 million hectares of native forests, which represents roughly, so keep in mind, this is a massive continent. Mm-hmm. Do you want to guess how much forests cover, percentage-wise, is the whole continent? 10%. Good guess. 19%. Oh, wow. Which is massive. Yeah, it's a lot more than I thought. The majority, you don't think that, though. <laughs> the majority of Australia's trees are hardwood trees, which typically is eucalyptus. There are many different species of eucalyptus. Rainbow eucalyptus is one of the famous ones everybody talks about because they're absolutely gorgeous trees. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so eucalyptus. Rather than softwoods like pine, they don't really have any of those type of trees. Uh, while some softwoods are dominate some other native forests, their total areas is judged by insignificant to con- or, const- or their total areas they occupy is in- in- oh, I can't talk today. <laughs> insignificant to contribute any majority forest type. So we're going to go over the major forest types of Australia's rainforest and just kind of see the absolute variety they have. But uh, basically it's saying there are softwood trees in Australia, but they're so low in abundance, they don't really contribute any major forest type. Gotcha. I guess they're really, this is going to be a really sciencey nature heavy episode till we get to the paranormal side of things. Good. The Forest Australia website provides us up-to-date information on Australia's rainforest. Detailed information on Australia's rainforest is available at the Australian State of Forestry Reports, and they're published every five years. There are 458 forest community distributions across Australia. These have been grouped into the following seven native forest types, which are characterized by the dominant species and structure of the forest. So what I'm going to tell you, this, these seven types are mostly the type of tree that dominates this forest. We have the same thing here in the States. We have the same thing anywhere. You know, old, old, old growth oak forest, you know, mm-hmm. that's what's that mean? It's the old trees. It's But they're almost all oak. Right, yeah. You know, so that kind of stuff. Yeah. So the first major forest type is Mela Eucari trees. What are those? They're just a the type of tree they have there. It, what's it comparable to? It's, they're not a lot here. Oh, okay. It's a very different tree. All right. Australia, you'll see, has pretty much all, a lot of different all stuff life going forms on. are unique. Uh, eucalyptus, or the eucalypti- eucalyptide trees, carcinera trees, calyrutus trees, archaea trees, and mangrove forest. Mangroves, we got them. Yeah, so, but they have actual forest. Of mangroves? Of mangroves. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so that's kind of it. The politics, there's a lot of politics involving Australia's in the rainforest. Because uh, they're being decimated, and people that live there or live near them don't want them to be decimated. Yeah, because they know the fern gully thing's about to happen. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go over some of the forests uh, where they're at in Australia. Just if you have questions, I'll try to answer some about them. So the Alpine National Forest is in Victoria. It's an extent of, of Mount Nash and Snow Gum Forest. Okay. De Angler. Literally. D, comma, Angler. Okay. National Forest is in Queensland, large nature reserve on the western boundary of the city of Brisbane, bordering both Mount Kutahari Reserve and support a large variety of native plants and animals. Brown Mountain Forest, and this isn't the U.S.'s Brown Mountain, but it's just as creepy. <laughs> Located in East Gippsland, Victoria, uh, it has large tracts of old growth forest. This is one of our older forests in Australia that is still standing. Okay. Uh, with most of the trees being estimated being over 300 years old. That's pretty old for, you know, forests nowadays. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Because yeah. we're, we're cutting them all down. Central Highland Forest, the Cumberland Plain Woodland, a wet tropic rainforest, which is actually a place. It's not just a, a type of, it's a place. Disappointment reference area. It's, that's what it's called? Yeah, extensive mountain ash forest with dense tree line of many creeks. Prior to the nineteen or the 2009 Black Saturday bushfires, which burnt the majority of the reference areas, this forest has not been burnt since the 1700s, making many of the trees 300 plus years old. Hmm. I don't know why it's called disappointment. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's like... But I it's a know. reference area. Yeah, so I don't I'm know. trying to I've, think I've of something. I've talked about reference areas before with my old career. 
is that that's our favorite areas because we'd go to the that's the most fish you'd get and all that stuff you know, the best variety of species and reference areas yeah because they use them to judge other areas oh okay, okay so when we'd score something that's the area we would use to score something against okay makes sense uh but yeah gloss jar national forest you know Anamurda national forest oh gosh glorari national rainforest we have a lot of australian listeners Please don't kill me. Just write in the correct pronunciations. Yeah, we do actually enjoy the... Uh, oh, the Australians the, are some of our funnest listeners. Yeah. Gulagook. Gulin gook. Yes, please please send the corrections in. <laughs> old, it's an old growth temperate rainforest. I can go on and on. There's just a bunch of lists. I just think it's cool that they have so many distinct rainforests. Yeah. In mountain ranges within these rainforests. But yeah. Mm. I do have one question. Yes, before I continue. Do you come from the land down under? Or the women glow? Me a Vegemite and the men plunder? I didn't know Vegemite was meat forever. It's not meat. It's like spam. No, it's like a, it's like, I thought it was like a vegetable spread. I thought it was like a beef paste. No, I think it's a veggie paste. You look it up. Look. No, because I think that's a misconception that Americans get. Because we hear the word veggie and assume it's plant. Well, to find out right here. Vegemite is a thick, dark brown Australian sp- food spread made from leftover brewer's yeast extract with various vegetable and spice additives. So it's made of yeast. That's a that's a bacteria. That's a living thing. Oh, that's your ju- yeah. It's got tardigrades in it. There it's you not go. vegetables. It's meat. It's yeah. It, 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 it adds vegetables, but it's not the base. <laughs> brewer's yeast. That's what it says. <laughs> I guess that's why they're all healthy down there. You think? So? Okay, Vegemite has a complex flavor that is profoundly savory and hyper rich in umami, which is meat, and it means it tastes like. It meat. also has a meaty flavor. Okay. Um. There you go. Yeah. There okay. You go. So that's it's relevant to this because you know you. Well, I I'm, forest, I'm skipping like tons and tons of rainforest, but the Wunanan National Park is New South Wales. Contains the only known wild specimen of the Woolanon pine trees. Oh, that's cool. A species that is thought to be extinct approximately 30 million years ago, but just discovered in three small stands in 1994. Now, that is awesome. Uh, 30 years ago. That's pretty significant. Extinct for 30 million, million years. Million, they thought. Yeah. Oh, okay. And you know why? You know why they just found it? Why? Because it sucks to walk through these <laughs> rainforest. I wonder. It's probably 30 feet off the path. Yeah. And finally, one biologist is like, okay, I got like six layers of Kevlar on. Let's try. A breathing apparatus walks in and finds a tree that's been extinct for 30 million years. years. And then died five minutes later. Oh, he got, he brought it out. <laughs> and then some frog touched his lip and he exploded. Yeah. <laughs> exploded. Instantly, too. Probably a brown snake got him. I wonder if we can get like little, uh, what, like little shoots of those, those trees. Uh, do, it would not do good here. Why not? They're a tropical rainforest tree. We got greenhouses. It's a tree. Well, here in Ohio, but here in the... It's a tree. <laughs> you start it somewhere. Over the years... Uh, so we're going to talk about brush fires. Over the years, brush fires have destroyed a lot of the trees and turned uh, the destructive of habitat of many animals. Most notably koalas, which have been plummeted by nearly 30% across Australia since 2018. Ooh. So just the last five, six years. Yeah. 30% of koalas are dead. That's not good. That's not good at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are some trees that are almost comparable to our redwoods. Uh, there's a you can look up a picture of a Mount Ash tree in Tasmania in the Styx Valley. Uh, it's 92 meters tall. Is Tasmania like just right off the northeast coast of Australia? I got my map above. I put a map in. So. Oh, nice for references. I think that's where Tasmania is. Straight right? below. Oh, it's below the east side. The east side. Yeah, because so, it used to connect. So between. New Zealand and Australia, that side, right? Yeah, New Zealand's way off the coast. Right, 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 right. But it's off that. It's on that side. Okay. Yeah. Getting a, a mental map in my own head. Yeah. So these rainforests, pretty much, uh, the strongest rainforest or the thickest rainforest, I'll say, is in. Let me pull up my picture. Uh, the so the southern tip of the western side because Australia is kind of like a bean shape with. For I call them like they almost look like horns. Yeah, every horn has a rainforest. Oh, really? Both north and south. Did not know that. Okay. Yeah, uh, the strongest rainforest, the most dense rainforest, are along the east coast and the southwest 
horn. Isn't the Southwest one the big one? Yeah, it's the most unresearched one. Yes. Uh, and we'll, I can't wait to talk about the monsters that have just wandered out of that one. Oh, gosh. Because they just look absolutely horrifying. Well, imagine if everything in there is already actively trying to kill everything else. Imagine the big predators that are actually are living in there that survive it. How scary and threatening they must be to make it through all that. This, I, I, I may just shrink this down to a one-part episode because we'll get there. We'll see. It's teaser. This is we'll teasing. Uh, so a guide to Australia's natural rainforest. For 180 million years, der- or dermatin trees rainforest in the northern end of Queensland to the cool, misty, temperate rainforest of Tasmania. And it, Tasmania is, itself is... I can't, I'm not even going to say, but Tasmania itself is such a wonderful, beautiful place. Mm. Like, it was separate from Australia. If you just look at Tasmania, Mm -hmm. it's just crazy gorgeous. Really? I think the last time we were connected, we covered it in the Trilocene episode, was probably 13 or 14,000 years ago was the last time they were connected. What what makes it so nice, I guess, in your opinion? It's just all forest. It's all old forest. There's very little urbanization. Uh, There's just a lot of old stuff still left. Reject urbanization. Embrace tradition. Do you know in Tasmania, there's no non-venomous snakes? Oh, really? Yeah. So everything will... Every snake is venomous. Whether it's, you know, extremely venomous or not, it's a different question, but Ah, every snake... Is that why the Tasmanian devil's always spinning around? Because to avoid the snakes. Man... You watch them eat wallabies and stuff. You know, they just rip the back ends of their at, legs out. I meant the cartoon. I meant the cartoon Tasmanian mm. Devil. The Taz. I meant the real ones, which are just as scary. I don't know. Taz is pretty dang scary. Australia's rainforest can be found right across the country, encompassing a world heritage site areas and hundreds of national parks and reservations. These rainforests are home to an extraordinary variety of plants and animals that are packed with spectacular waterfalls, idyllic swimming holes, breathtaking hiking trails, and much, much more. They are to be wild, but easily explored. So a lot of these rainforests have little cool, like, uh, just walking areas, hiking areas. You can go to them. Uh, as long as you don't go off the trail, you'll probably be okay kind of mm-hmm. deal. But if you go off the trail, you know. You're going to die. Yeah, it's, you know, people go missing in Australia a lot. Like, You, you know what I just realized that I think is going to make you angry by the time I finish saying it? Mm. Not think I know. You know what Tasmanian Devil the cartoon? You know what he is? He's not the Tasmanian devil, the animal. He's a blemmy. No, he has a head. Yeah, it's in his torso. No, when they, they've they showed his skeleton in the cartoon before, and his head's actually separate. He's got a neck. That, that's, well, so do blemmies. It's just, it's different. Hey. All right. So, fun facts. Don't, We're going to start going through some of these really cool rainforests. Don't hide the truth. Let the truth be known. So, Blemmies live in Australia. In the Dermatin or Dermatry rainforest, uh, you would love the main flower. Am I still muted? Yeah. Oh, come on. Oh, yeah, I'm back. You would love the main flower that it's named after. Hmm. It's also known as the idiot fruit. <laughs> what? Seriously, that's the name? Yeah, it's also known as the green dinosaur. One of the Earth's rarest and oldest flowering groups. <laughs> Wait, wait, hold on, just stop. It's it's called either the green dinosaur or the idiot or fruit. the idiot fruit. Because if you eat it, you'll die. <laughs> well, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, you see some guy pick it like that's an idiot. So why wait? Why green dinosaur? Because it's a huge green plant. Okay, and it's the oldest and rarest flowering group of plants on the planet. Oh, okay, that's pretty cool. I just, I said that, but you ignored it because you were laughing about idiot fruit. <laughs> well, that's pretty funny. But no, so the, the Dermatree tree rainforest is between Carnes and Cooktown, which we've talked about Cooktown on the show before, both uh, Megalania and the Bunyip episode. Okay. Which those guys make a comeback. All right. Uh, the world's oldest rainforest, the Dermatin tree, is so beautiful and lush that it has inspired the movie Avatar. So this is one of the rainforests mm. they went to to actually get some of those images for it. This place doesn't look real. I love it. I want to go there so bad. I want to go to Australia. It's on my. It's the first country I'll probably ever leave the U.S. to go explore. It's like all the giant leaves and stuff, right? Yeah. Okay. But I mean, it looks otherworldly. Right. So it's a World Heritage listed site just alone for its biodiversity. Okay. So right, there's kind of the misconception we've talked about before. Rainforests aren't biomass heavy for animals. They are biodiverse. Many species low abundance. Okay. Not high abundance. So, so a lot of animals, 
but few species. This has a lot of species, species. few animals. Okay. So gotcha. animals can be hard to find naturally in rainforest mm-hmm. because they're so competitive. Because normally rainforest soils are so poor. It's very, you know, food is very driven. Right. So it's home to 663 species of animal. That's not that much. It's a lot. Is it that? Is it a lot? Yes. I feel like there'd be more or something. 230 species of butterfly. Oh, that's a lot. And 200, or 2,800 different plant species, most of which are not found anywhere else in the world except this rainforest. Three-fourths of the plants in this rainforest are only found in this rainforest. That's pretty awesome. It's such it's a magical place. And I yeah. may be not doing the best job of actually explaining, like, the oldest group of flowering plants is only found here. Right. They're literally called the green dinosaur hmm. because they're just, they're from, you know, they're so prehistoric. It truly is otherworldly. It is. It's also a great place to spot crocodiles as well as many elusive sp- species such as the flightless cassowary, cassowary, sorry, tree kangaroos, and the stunning Ulysses butterfly. What's what's so significant about that? It's, it's hyper endangered rare species of butterfly. Okay. Uh, you can go here. So this, I, I got little like tourist tr- trip tips for all these like the ones i'm going to go into depth about uh if you had to experience it take a walk with an aboriginal guide and learn how they used to utilize these forest riches for centuries now that would be awesome And it's the mosin men gorge center they do like you can pay an aboriginal man or woman to kind of walk you through and explain some of the natural stuff all right bucket list oh and if you're keen on getting wet you can even float through the rainforest on a river draft snorkeling adventure tour Keep in mind, there are crocodiles. Yeah, I don't want to do that. But you have an Aboriginal guide, and he'll be I don't like, care. he'll do the weird little hand thing, and the crocodile swim away. Oh, <laughs> uh, you mean, yeah, like crocodile Dundee? Yeah. <laughs> Start swimming the other way. I'll do one more rainforest before our ad break, and then we'll get back to rainforest. All right. I promise everybody at home, we have a lot of paranormal coming. Oh, yeah. Uh, I just, I think I'm really trying to hit home of just how otherworldly and rare and wonderful these rainforests truly are. And like we said at the very beginning, I, when you think of Australia, you I, I always thought of just outback, the desert. You Which know, I harsh. love the outback species. Yeah. The outback as an environment right. has produced some of the coolest animals on this planet. Right. But so have their immense rainforests. I just never, when I picture Australia in my head, never once do I think rainforest. 19% of the continent. It's pretty big. That's pretty big. That's uh, that's probably be the that's size like, of most countries. I mean, it's a fifth of yeah, exactly. It's rainforest, but yeah, in my head, it's just Australia, desert. You're gonna die if you go out there like alone. Oh, uh, you may, which you will, but you may, like, but it's a rainforest that you should expect. Well, that. Yes, yes, if you wander a rainforest alone, yes, you will. You will be if you're not if you're not an Aboriginal, you will be dead. All right, I'm gonna talk about the Gondwana. So Gond. Awani rainforest. Okay. And keep my most of these words are Aboriginal. I don't speak any of those languages, but I'm trying my best. Or Australian. You don't speak that either. No, I mean, that's, yeah. All right. So, yeah, this is located in uh, Queensland. So, if you ever wondered what life was like 180 million years ago, pack your bags on a trip to Ghanawani rainforest and you're in for a treat. This World Heritage listed rainforest system isn't just a rainforest, but an ancient supercontinent that once took up more than a fifth of the planet. Today, this ancient ecosystem is where you'll find endemic plants and animals dating back millions of years, including the lyrebirds and browry birds, some of which are the world's oldest vertebrate species. Mm. So these guys are up there with like hellbenders and stuff like that with how old of a species they gotcha. are. Gotcha. Okay. So th- literally, this rainforest is so cool because it's a walk through time. I was just going to say it, like a time capsule. And literally, minus the dinosaurs, which there's cassowaries, so there still is dinosaurs. True. They look very similar to what I think dinosaurs look like. And I bet there's some other stuff that we haven't even discovered yet. In like there. I said, you're not leaving the trails. Right, yeah. You know, if you like to hike, you know, so this is how to experience it the best, as far as the travel agencies and all, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, you, well, if you like to hike, you can walk through the Springbrook or the Lamington National Park. With a rainforest or with rainforest tours Australia to discover this cascading waterfalls, breathtaking lookouts, and iconic natural bridges. So there's these big stone bridges. And Those are like, so awesome. So yeah, this is one that uh, there's there's tourist groups for all of these, and they it's really weird when you watch the tourist trails, they barely take you in. Yeah. And it's still you're seeing the most Amazing immensely things. crazy beautiful things, yeah. plants, animals, you know. Yeah, because they can't take you in because it's a 
a life risk. Yeah, I mean, you may die. Right. Uh, I mean, just the snakes. And I like snakes, and I'm not scared of venomous snakes. But if you don't know. Right. And if one, yeah, exactly. And then, but not just the snakes. I'm sure every spider there will be murder you. See, you're not going to, in my opinion, my humble opinion. Now, there are one, like there are a lot of like harvesting spiders and stuff like that. They'll come in your house and bite you. Uh-huh. In Australia, there's just a lot. Yeah, a lot of stuff. If you get bit in Australia, just assume you're, you're going to die. Right, yeah. Uh, a rabid wallaby might just come charging you. If you're lucky. If you're lucky. Yeah. All right. Hey, extra for that tour. We're going to take a little ad break, and we'll be right back. There's no music for this one. And we're back. Why didn't we do music? I always like the music. I didn't want to go hit the button. Oh, my goodness. Well, the way we sit now to kind of get rid of that weird little echo I was getting, I'm very far. I need to stretch the keypad in the middle of the table. You need. You know what you need? Hmm. The thing longer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the Otway Forest and the Great Ocean Road. Ooh, the Ocean Road, huh? Yeah. So this is a fun fact about this. Madeline Golly, also known as the Jewel of Otway, gleams with lights from thousands of glowworms. Have you ever seen pictures of the like those caves that just glow like they're mm-hmm. stars? That's this place. In Australia of all places. The Otenway so where Otenway is about a two and a half hour drive from Melbourne, Australia and Victoria. Uh it's Great Ocean Road. Step away from the day to day worries under the lush canopy of some of Australia's tallest rainforests and the densest and diversest Otenway range. One of the sides of the wildlife wonderfuls You'll find cascading waterfalls, treetop adventures, and ancient plant life. But venture towards the sound of waves to discover limestone cliffs and the beautiful blue bays enveloping the green wilderness. It's not just the landscape that makes Ocean Way so special, but the abundance of wildlife that calls it home. Typically spotted resident or typically spotted residents include the sleepy koala, the hyper elusive platypus during the winter months, and southern right whales come right along the coastal way for back scratches. Ooh, nice. So this is, keep in mind, you can take two steps and see a platypus and a southern right whale. <laughs> That's pretty significant. Th- this place isn't real. Well. Isn't that crazy? That is pretty nice. You can stand on the edge of a rainforest and see a platypus and a southern right whale at the same time. And it wouldn't even be, like, out of the ordinary. No, they both live there. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. Because the rainforest butts right up to these giant limestone cliffs. So right whales go to these cliff faces underneath to use these giant boulders as, as scratches. Okay. So they'll often, they're there using these these rocks as whale spots. Well, back scratchers. Mm-hmm. And southern right whales are one of the rarest species of whale to see. And platypus are pretty rare themselves as Even well, too. where they live in Australia, they're hyper rare. Yeah. I think we need to go. We need to, we need to get... Go here. So how uh, how to experience it? Soar above the forest floor on a zip line tour oh. from Odaway Flying Tree Top Adventures. And if you prefer to have fun for two wheelers, there's a mountain bike trail around the township forest. Now a zip line. And know, they promise not to let you get eaten. You know it'd be co- even cooler than a zip line? Hmm. Those little alpine like roller coaster things. You know what I'm talking about? No, I just seen one get a bear got hit on those and like ripped the guy's ear off in Tennessee. It's just an ear. Yeah, he got lucky because he uh, released the brake and started moving. Because he smacked a bear and the bear would just turn around and was just so mad. It'd be like on uh, the movie Almost Heroes where his ear gets ripped off. Now you hit now you hit a Euro beast and it just turns around and bites your skull. I'd probably explode. <laughs> or you would first. But still an alpine coaster through the rainforest. Now, now that would be that would be pretty cool. Now we're talking. Uh but they try to do the least invasive things as they can. And oh, that yeah. building those are pretty invasive. I guess so. I guess you're <laughs> they're pretty bad, yeah. Uh, Tasmanian Wilderness. So this is an area. Uh, so Russell's Falls, Mount Field National Park is in Tasmania, uh, where the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area spans across over seven national parks and reserves west of Holbert. So this is in Tasmania. So basically it's this this natural heritage site, the Tasmanian Wilderness is what it's called, is seven national parks that is overall lumped into one World Heritage Site. Okay. Australia has... One of the highest density of world heritage forests in the world, too. Mm, that's pretty, pretty cool. Pretty much all of the rainforest or world heritage sites, which when we get to the end of this episode, won't make any sense. Why? Oh, I guess. Well, when we yeah. get to the end of the episode, yeah. it won't make any sense. I just want to know now. Uh, Russell, uh, so where the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Site spans across, like I said, covering almost a fifth of Tasmania. That's okay. Which people think Tasmania well, is small because you look at it on the map yeah. next to Australia. It's massive. 
So it's the same proportion as uh, Australia is, like to with its rainforest. Nineteen percent. Yeah. Twenty percent is fifth. So yeah. same thing. Yeah. And I'm so sorry. Where was I? And it's uh, the wet, wild, and largest untouched uh, forest is the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Site. Combines natural beauties and ancient cultures. It is a cool climate rainforest. We call those temperate rainforest, like the Pacific Northwest. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, I'm sorry. It is the it is it, know, where was I? One of three remaining temperate wilderness areas in the entire southern hemisphere. Hmm. These are where the blemmies live. Known for its conservation of rare and hyper endangered species of plants and animals, most of which are only endemic to the region. Explore this pristine habitat, and you'll not only be supplied to come upon iconic wildlife, but ancient Aboriginal artifacts and limestone caves that are more than 30,000 years old. That's awesome. That's so cool. This place isn't real, right? Well, yeah, I've seen it on the map. I mean, just... <laughs> and I am I know no, it's like, it's a it's an audio media and stuff, so I can't show you guys pictures. Right, right. Even pictures of these rainforests. Literally, James Cameron went to... That's James Cameron that did Avatar, right? Yeah. He went to and they, that is this is Pandora. When you see the first movie and see the rain, the lush, crazy looking deep sea almost rainforest. It's Tasmania. No, it's Australia and Tasmania. These okay, forests, like when you walk yeah. through, they're not real. Right. Like the Hobbit when they were going through the forest and stuff is in. Yeah. Is in well, that's New Zealand, but still they're still down they're that, temperate forest. Yeah, it's down the same area. All right. So I did the forest for you, and hopefully you get a feel that these are truly ancient almost mythical places in themselves, mm-hmm. which I truly believe. Mm-hmm. And they're, as far as forests go, you know, they're true. Let's talk about some monsters that oh. wandered out of this. So we're jumping from, now we're jumping to the cryptid side. Mm-hmm. And then we'll get to the paranormal, and then we'll end it all. Okay. Euro beast. Euro? Yes, Euro. It's a town. It's not, it's spelled okay. a little different. Not like European. No, no, it's spelled a little different. Okay. The Euro beast is approximately about 30 feet long, a bulldog-faced amphibious beast sighted in the 1890s. The first accounts of this bizarre event were published in the Brisbane Courier in the Melbourne August of February 28th in Mar- and again on March 1st of 1890. The story begins in an area known as okay, Wailoumbi, located near the township of Euro. Australia, where a, uh, a Kincaid of care or credible witnesses testified that the swamp had been infested by an unidentifiable 30-foot-long monstrosity since 1884. The Brisbane Courier published an article which it claimed to be written by the Euro correspondent of the Melbourne August on February 25th of 1890. And it says, considerable excitement has been caused by the in Euros about reports of an extraordinary animal having been seen in the swamp about 14 miles distance. The swamp is about 150 yards across. The creek flows through it. For six years or more, the swamp has been uh, raptured to have been haunted by some abnormally uh, tall being, told uh, uh, told of dogs flying out of place and never being seen again. It's very written weird, 1890s Australians. Wait, so question though, but... So they're seeing this, what they describe as this tall, long monster... And it just grabs dogs and throws them. But it says 30 feet. They said 30 feet long in the beginning, but is it 30 feet tall? No, 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 no. It's it's 30 feet long. We'll so it's like there. on all fours? Yeah. Okay. Oh, very Bunyip-esque. Okay. Uh, some of the Bunyip descriptions, which we talked about in our Bunyip episode. A lot of different. Which, Bunyip is probably eight different cryptids. Yes, or just eight really different phenotypes. No. Oh. Just different animals. <laughs> uh, so where it was? I seen dogs flying. Last week, a couple of young men went into the swamp in a pursuit of cutting reeds, which are six feet high and very thick. And they were alarmed by the sudden splashing. And uh, sorry, they were alarmed by the sudden splashing and snorting near the hand. And they rushed wave as if allowing passage of some extremely large animal. They quickly retired, but next day out ventured back to carry out the reeds they had cut. When they had again been alerted by a strange sound, he leaped upon a log. At some 30 paces away, he saw a large head up rear, which he likened that of a bulldog. It kept its position for about 10 minutes when it disappeared. The motion of the reeds gave the idea that the animal was at least 30 feet long. The young man was greatly scared. So before I continue, basically, 
they describe it bulldog, very flat, big, flappy face. Mm-hmm. Uh, we could be thinking walrus or elephant seal here almost. Yeah. A huge animal. It's bigger than any of those by far, but you know, we right. talked about fear. 30 feet's pretty dang big. Uh, but also some of the bunyip descriptions. This is one of those stories that gets called a bunyip, but also gets called a megalania. So this is kind of those weird stories where it kind of gets thrown around into other things. Uh, a lot of cryptid researchers just kind of put it as the Euro beast itself because they really don't know if it's one of the other things. What if this is like what dinosaurs were look like when we find their bones? It's just something weird like this, like a bulldog-faced amphibian. Well, they, there's some reconstructionists that put them almost more mammalian. Mm. Uh, you can look it up. I mean, we did this seal spinosaurus last week. Oh, yeah, that's right, yeah. Was that last week? Jeez. Well, I mean, last week on recording, not last week on this show. That's probably a month ago. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the young men were greatly scared. One of the reports of the current appearance in the local journal of the party of uh, Euro, Euro uh, sportsmen went to the swamp, where they had joined the local residents on horseback. After beating about for about an hour, they were about to give up their quest when suddenly a rustling they heard. The two men in the party saw an enormous tail as thick as a man's thigh disappear into a large trunk of a fallen tree. A shot was fired at the animal, but the effects of the matter were conjure or conjecture. I'm sorry. Mm. So yeah. So it it went into the tree. This is where they call it a bunyip for the first time. Oh, okay. Attempts were made to dislodge the bunyip, but to no avail. Basically, this creature had rammed itself into the like uh, underneath a tree. Right. And if you don't think a large creature can fit underneath a tree, there's a video of a guy uh, finding a crocodile wallow underneath a tree, and it doesn't look like nothing. And he sees the tip of the tail, and he starts dragging it out. And he's like, "Oh, we got a croc under here. You know, he's messing with this croc." He starts dragging it out, and he's like, I feel there's only like a six-foot croc. It's like a 13, 14-foot. <laughs> Jeez. And he's like, because you just like, the tail kept getting bigger and yeah. bigger. And he's like, he's got to be asleep because he should be mad. Yeah. Let- and he's like, I'm kind of scared he's actually turned back around looking at me. Oh, yeah. Because he's like, he's a lot bigger than I thought. Yeah. So he maybe just curled around in here. Yeah. And I'm playing with his tail, and his head's like right there. So, Yeah. Basically, they go and they try to hunt it, and it doesn't. It just doesn't work out. This is where they start calling it a bunyip, but other people start calling it a sea serpent, and because it's some people that had seen it during this original hunt say it had much more reptilian traits. Interesting. Uh, very much like a large monster lizard without legs, but with flippers. Giant salamander. I mean, it could be, or the uh, the or the megalania, the actual giant monster lizards that lived in Australia. Oh yeah, or them too. They got forty feet. Yeah. <laughs> Very uh, well, could just be that. And then, uh, but, but the bulldog face uh, that could be kids being scared. You know, the first the bulldog thing came from those first two kids. Mm-hmm. So you know, you just see it in just teeth, I something guess. big and angry in teeth. Yeah, maybe they cut catch it at a straight on angle. Yeah, it's also they're cutting reeds and they were just about to leave. So I'm going to assume it was getting towards dark. Look at that too. Yeah, but who knows? You know, anything's possible. Ha. <laughs> uh. Some people said this creature was much more canine-like. Okay. Which said it was just like a giant aquatic dog, which makes more people think it was a seal. Which we've talked about with the Bunyip episode. Elephant seals, in particular in Australia, will end up in the weirdest, worst places. Right, yeah. And then they can be aggressive. Uh, I can't remember the one that's famous right now. He has his own TikTok. A s- elephant seal? Yeah, he's a juvenile male, and he's like destroying this little town. And they can't. he's endangered. They can't do nothing. Uh, But, like, this one lady had a call off for work because, literally, he had shoved his head under her car. And she couldn't get out? she was napped. Well, no, you're not allowed to mess with him. Okay. Poke him with a stick. He's he's destroying mailboxes and fence. Yeah. I think his name's Steven. And he has his own TikTok, huh? The cops are allowed to kind of, like, help him back to the water. Yeah. And they just kind of have these guiding sticks. Yeah, that'll help. But, no, just kind of to poke him. They're like, eat, and then somebody's like, they're whacking Steven off camera and stuff like that. And they're like, no, if we whack Steven, he would turn around and kill us. <laughs> yeah. You don't realize he's, you know, he's 15 foot long and 4,000 pounds. Well, where did he get a cell phone to record all this stuff? The town does it. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I know. <laughs> but I'm imagining, though, Steven, wait, what would his handle be? Steven the Elephant Seal, like, <laughs> doing selfie videos on TikTok? So... A couple cryptid researchers claim this creature is actually a giant ancestral amphibian, like a salamander. 
Yeah. Thanks for taking my last little paragraph. Oh, I'm sorry. I always do it. Uh, and it's Fianna Day, a short squat, presumably extinct. It, this was a very crocodile-like salamander. Okay. So that's this could be where some of the weirdness for the description comes from. The ancient. They would have a much wider, flatter face. Yeah, didn't well, they, they used took, to? Yeah. They okay. would take the same niche as a crocodile. Right. So that could be why it's, there's so many saying it's a sea serpent, but very crocodile, but also kind of mammally, because they would have the big flappy skin, and you see hellbenders have like the wrinkles and stuff like that. Like okay, a yeah. Uh, even, you know, they're not mammals, but they kind of have that look. Uh, so they think it's from the Carnivorous period. But we'll talk about time slips later and that kind of stuff. So there's a chance that it's that thing. So that's why I think we did include this one in our bunyip episode because some people do include it as a bunyip. Yeah. Uh, to me, I don't think this is a bunyip. It's hard to tell. It could be a bunyip. could not be. It's, it's old. You know, it's over 150 years old at this point. There was this one. Uh, I'm trying to find it now. I remember they found like a, an ancient like giant salamander type creature like fossil. Mm-hmm. They just dug up like a couple years ago. Does that ring a bell at all? Sure. Yeah, there's several. I just cannot Kula remember. Kulasukas is one of the bigger. Maybe that was something like that. Yeah. Uh, I think 25 feet long. Okay. And they, so giant salamanders, which everybody, if you're listening this far into this episode, if you can help us out, we're going to go hunt the trains up giant salamander. The Kickstarter may, will be live soon. It started March 15th, whenever this episode comes out. If you can help us, help us. Even if you just share it, that helps a lot. We're going to rediscover but the Trinity like, Alps giant salamander. Kulasukas was this weird supersized salamander that lived through the entire reign of the dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. All three like minor mass extinctions in the dinosaurs, they lived through them all and were just always there. And it was just it's just really weird that giant salamanders have been kind of here since big animals existed. It's a good body plan. It is. It's just the slow uh, they're good parents most of the time. They will eat. They're cannibalized. They're young. Oh, yeah. But they will guard their eggs, which is a big deal because egg predators are their biggest threats as, as larval salamanders. Okay, yeah. So if you your dad and mom is both guarding the egg clutch and giant Japanese, giant Chinese hellbenders, all giant salamanders we know of do this. And it's just to signify they don't breed very often. and They don't have tons of babies like other salamanders so every they, year. They need to, yeah. like, protect them. Yeah. And then as soon as the babies hatch, they got to get the heck away from mom and dad. Because they can't resist the temptation of eating their own. All right. We're going to talk about this legendary creature next. Oh, a giraffe? The Yarme Yahoo. Yarme Yahoo. That's phonetical. So I think I'm... Yarme Yahoo? I think you say it fast, you know. Okay. It's Yarme Yahoo. Okay. Yarme Yahoo. And you've seen pictures of this creature. This is a little red big-headed creature that lives in trees in Australia in the rainforest? I don't know. Uh, some people say it's a frog, man. We'll get there. The Yarme Yahoo is a legendary creature found in Australia in Aboriginal mythology. This creature is often described as being small, red-skinned, humanoid-like, with an extremely large head and a wide, gaping mouth. So kind of frogman-esque. So paint the frogman red. Okay. And it lives in the trees. Okay. That's this thing. According to legends, the creature lives in fig trees and rainforests and drops down on unsuspecting travelers to drain them of their blood. Oh, my gosh. Oh, it gets worse. The Yarmiyahu is known for its particular characteristics in hunting behaviors, representing one of the more unique and unsettling aspects of indigenous folklore of Australia. It is said that the creature has, has suckers on the ends of its hands and feet. Uh, to me, we'll talk about what this creature could be. We talked about what the other one may be. Oh, I know what they are. But it's got suckers... On the, just the ends of its fingers. You know what this thing? I'm going to tell you what it is. Okay. It's a it's the evolved version of the octopus that made it to land and learned to live in the trees. Uh, the uh, the California tree squid. Yes. No octopus, tree octopus. So it said the creature has suckers on the ends of its hands and feet, which it uses to attach itself to its prey. Once it has drained enough blood, the creature the creature then regurgitates the victim. Now to smaller size. So. It attacks them, grabs them, sucks some blood. It swallows the person, and it barely fits the first time. Okay. Spits them back out. And they're a little smaller this time, and a little more red. And it swallows them again, and spits them back out again. And they're a little smaller, a little more red. And until eventually, they call, they become one of these yahoos. They become one? Yeah. That's the whole, they're more part of the reproductive process. This, Yeah. So basically, if you you can save somebody, so there used to be talks of some of the Aborigines having a, a more of a, a red pigment to their skin. Yeah. 
I mean, you know, they're very dark because they live in the outback. Right. They have a lot right. of melanin. But and they think they, they say that that was somebody got saved during that process. Because as long as you get saved while you're still a person, you're going to be okay, but you'll be pink or red yeah. for an extended period of time and stuff like that. It's just, just an odd Yarmy way to reproduce. Yahoo. Despite its terrifying reputation, the Army Yahoo has become a popular subject in modern Australian culture, appearing in books, movies, television shows, like the Kappa in Jap- Japan. Right, yeah, yeah. You know, this actually horrible creature in mythology. For the most part. Stealing the butthole orb. Yeah, I mean, you know, some people might enjoy that. No. Oh. But yeah, so, but now it's very popular in TV shows and that kind of stuff. And the Bunyip did the same thing in Australia. Wait, this little, the Yarmy Yahoo is popular? Yeah, it's loved in Australia. Why? It, and, and you let me read. <laughs> its unique appearance and behaviors make for a fascinating creature of study. And its place in Aboriginal mythology provides an insight into the beliefs and values of the indigenous people. Well, the big one for these guys is saving somebody. You know, going out of your way to look for somebody that goes missing and stuff like that. Gotcha. Because there's these, not only is there actual horrible dangers in Australia, there's also frog puck wedgies that right. will swallow you and regurgitate you. So you don't, yeah, people go missing, you know, you go out, there's a good chance they got bit by a snake or, you know, they touched the wrong plant. But then you turns up, you find this like half digested blob that keeps getting spit out of this thing. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, it's very frog like. So they literally describe it in Aboriginal trans uh, translations. Frog man like, or so frog like man woman. Okay. Or woman. Uh, so it's they call it a frog man. Basically, yeah, it is the About Australian four frog foot man. Foot tall, but it does it. The only thing is, this thing has a flowing mane of hair. It's the Australian version. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it has the Australian mullet going on? Yeah. Uh, it unhinges its jaw like a snake, and it's said to be absolutely scary when it's uh, swallowing somebody. So it's like a giant Pac-Man frog with a cool mullet, and he just looks at you and goes, that's not a frog. This is a frog. Uh, but these guys are specifically in forest. Uh, fig trees is one of their favorites. Uh, they do love the northern regions of Australia in the temperate and tropical rainforest. So this is one of the things they look up. Uh, but yeah, let me find you. So possible things are, this could be, uh, some people say this could be a story about a remnant lemur population in Australia. So Australia, as far as I know, has no real true primates. Uh, I may be wrong. It happens, but they think there, there was a chance there's some remnant lemurs, which are ancient marsup or not ancient marsup, ancient primates. What are they? Vampire uh, lemurs? But lemurs can be, uh, lemurs get the short end of the stick a lot. Like, eye eyes were said to be cursors and bringers of doom, uh-huh. and they literally just eat bugs. Yeah. Because they look weird. Right. So they were accused of doing, and they were killed because they were accused of being evil. Just because they looked weird, yeah. too. <laughs> they got big eyes and a long, the long finger. But, so there's some thoughts that, my kind of thing on the more paranormal mythological side, is I think this may be their frog man or their puck wedgies, one, one type of their fae. Right, yeah. And just a warning about how dangerous fae can be. Or the fae in the forest itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you keep chopping it down. Uh, these things are going to react. 100%. All right. My last one we're going to go into depth about is the Will of the Wisp. Okay. An ancient mystery with extremophile origins, question mark. I actually found a scientific article about this. Wow. A scientific article about the Will of the Wisp. They think... Uh, I'm gonna. I will talk about the Will of the Wisp, but this article goes into depth. And this is by Helen G. M. Edwards, Doctor Helen G. M. Edwards. Um, and it came out 2014. There really hasn't been more dived into about it. I just thought it was cool. I found an actual scientific paper. Will of the Wisp are almost always seen in forest, near water, reeds, and that kind of stuff. Wetlands will work too, but water, rivers, and wetlands. Mm-hmm. Okay. In the forest. So they this the scientific group really narrowed it down to certain types of habitat that these pheno- phenomena are seen. Let me go into the phenomena. Will of the wisp are almost always blue lights. I think they're also called the in Australia the Mimi lights or the the Mimsy lights, something like that. They got an M word for them. Yeah, I'm not sure. Where the Australians will see them like I heard I think it was on Derek's show, uh, Monsters Among Us, about an Australian girl seeing these lights bounce about in there. She was going to go out and investigate, and her dad said, "No, you don't follow those." those you know, they'll lead you to your death. Oh, it's a trickster. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, we talked about with North American trickster spirits, whether they're good, bad, and different. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't know. 
But yeah, so basically you see these lights and the will of the wisp in their Australian rainforest are much more, in my opinion, intelligent than some of the lights we have here in North America where they interact with you. They definitely react to your presence, whether mm-hmm. they run away from you, come at you, dance, you know, do all these kind of things. Right. They know you're there and they're interacting with you and having a lot of in quote unquote fun with you. We just don't know what they are. Right, yeah. But all I I said, a lot of the scientific community in Australia agrees that they're real. Is that significant? Yes. It's just, it's like ball lightning kind of deal. We don't really know what the phenomena is. Wait, did these Australians peer review this first? No, they don't have that kind of, they don't have the same thing. Oh, good. Yeah, this is just the guy who published it. Okay, good. So this paper draws a comparison between the 700-year-old historical reports of the Will of the Wisp phenomena with more recent discoveries of extremophile colonizations of hostile environments. Both the observed as a present in isolated stressful environment regions and obtaining from biological phenomena. However, where more extremophile activity can understand the terms of survivability strategies based on the synthetic uh, specific suits of productive bioluminescent chemicals, which is designed to control biogeographical stresses in the habitat. Basically, they think there may be a species of extremophile we don't know about yet. Okay. And the Australian rainforest is so hard to research. Right. That they think this is a stress response. So I, I shared a recently, you know, I don't know when this comes out, but recently I shared a video on the Instagram of the glowing oceans. When you swim through them and stuff like yeah. that, it glows. That's a defense mechanism to alert either to alert that they're being eaten and make the predator's scene stick out. So hopefully their predator comes and gets them. Right. Or to tell others about it. So they kind of think there is this aeroplankton oh. that exists in Australia in these dense rainforests that is kind of like a living cloud that moves through the forest. And the will of the wisp is insects that may be eating them, flying through the cloud, agitating them, and the glow is actually they light up. the lighting up around the, the attacker, hmm. signaling, hey, this is where they are. That's a pretty good theory. It's, and I thought it was – this is from 2014. That this article never got ten, traction. Ten years ago. And they're talking about – they're talking about aeroplankton and Will of the Wisp and all this stuff. And they go into – this article is massive. Yeah. And they have it – they have it actually kind of uh, coded down to where it does seem to be more common in areas with pollutions. High male toxicities, high salt concentrations, high energy radiation isolations, temperature extremes. So maybe either these aeroplankton are drawn to that or they feed off of it. They're both both could be possible. We are also going to more go on that, that they are the fae. Mm. Far that, and gully. That they're literally, what did the, the, when they're flying. You're talking the, what's the fae? The fairies. No, 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 I mean. Uh, will the, the will wisp wisp. are the fae. The okay. glowing balls of light that kind of bounce around and go yes. through. Literally, Fern gully. That was what they would turn into. It was mostly blue and green bowls of light, and they would fly through the forest. Yeah, they would, wouldn't they? Yes. I never thought about that. Um, and they, they go into some really historic. Uh, I'll give you one description. A wandering fire, compact of unconscious vapor, which in the night condenses in the cold environs around us, kindled through the ignition of a flame, of which they say some evil spirits attend. So that's just one guy in the that was eighteen seventeen describing what seeing these things move around him in the forest. Yeah. He has his campfire set up. That was in the eighteen what? I think eighteen seventeen was that one. Eighteen seventeen? Yeah. That's a pretty good uh description for watching these things like that far, you know, long ago. Mm-hmm. And I just one more thing. Scientists observed some characteristics. Uh and here's the most le- your most information following the will of the wisp from the scientific study. Small dancing flames observed in marshlands often closely associated with standing water and reeds. Bluish luminosities with a yellow center, which is not significant to illuminate the ground. The flame persists for up to 15 minutes in the same place, often located six feet apart or two meters above the ground. The flames are cool to the touch from some of the witnesses of flame to touch them, and six inches tall approximately, one and a half inch wide. Hmm. So almost like a flying candle. Hmm. I wonder how big... So six inches, roughly? And this is, they took over 2,000 descriptions and encounters in the study and kind of came up with this. One more, multiple occurrences are often reported. So in this study, they found if you see one, you often see See them multiple times. Gotcha, okay. 
The flames are suspect in the air currents and could be reliably extinguished. So they say that if you get near them and kind of wave at them or a gust of wind can put them out. So they seem to be almost actual flames. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay. But they, so they, this whole study goes back to the an almost an aeroplankton side of it. Yeah. We may do a whole episode on just the Australian Will of the Wisp because there's so much. I think it's worthy. There's, I mean, I skipped over thousands of words. Yeah. But yeah, Australia, yeah. Well, if if you would like to have an in-depth episode on the Will of the Wisp, Will of the Wisp, is that how you say it? Will of the Wisp? Will O. O the Wisp. Just O. No, the? No, Will O the Wisp. Will O, Will O the Wisp. If you'd like a full-on, in-depth, science-heavy episode, just leave us a comment on whatever you're listening so platform. B- before we wrap this episode up, I think we're just going to do a one episode on this one. Okay. Uh, I have just a couple more things because I think that we could really dive into any of these parts much more in depth. Yeah. But monsters that we have talked about that we left out this episode. Megalania is right. a big one. Uh, Megalania is the, if anybody may not be familiar, go back and listen to that episode. Just go uh, to our page is and the Komodo, Google it. Yeah. It is the Komodo dragon cousin that lived in Australia and the Aborigines said is still alive in these rainforests. Which I believe is still alive, especially in these rainforests. Uh, but you know, thirty, forty foot long Komodo dragon. We still have modern sightings. Yeah, we yes, a lot of them. Next one, the trilocene. Okay. Do we still have sightings? Like last week, there Wait, was a good trilocene. Sighting. Yeah, thylacine. Thylacine. There we go. Thylacine. Uh, the thylacine are Tasmanian tiger. Yep. Which they are in Australia and Tasmania, or Australian mainland and Tasmania. Recently extinct. Supposedly, yeah. I mean, yeah. There's, they're still around. Yeah, and there's big fights with those guys right now. We did an episode on those. Listen to that. Uh, the bunyip did an episode on that. Uh, basically, you know, they're seen around the waterways and the rainforest of Australia, in the Oxbow Lakes, in the Oxbow Lakes, and then the hi- hidden giant crocodiles or the oceanic crocodiles. A lot of our sightings of truly massive crocodiles are hidden in Australia in the rainforest and deltas. Things we didn't talk about yet on this show that are also common in these rainforests as far as cryptids go black cats or black cat like things abcs yeah okay. are often often seen in the australian rainforest or on the edge of them that's pretty interesting uh i have a theory which will when we ever do the episode on the australian black cats that uh, they're the, the other abc australian black cats yeah they're not cats at all they're probably something like the thylacolia which is a marsupial that took the niche of big cat Okay, I've never even heard of that one. Yeah, you have their own arc. They're the things that climb on the side of trees and have the weird cutting teeth. Uh, the the ones you can ride up, like yeah. you can ride on and ride up yeah. walls and stuff. Okay, the yaoi. The, oh. the, the two types of yaoi are both often associated with the outback and the Australian rainforest. Mm-hmm. Uh, several dinosaurs or dinosaur-like things. I mean, like all kinds of dinosaurs okay. have been seen in the Australian rainforest, like a ton. Interesting. Antlered wombats. <laughs> okay. Now, there are a couple ancient... So the biggest marsupial ever exists was basically a, a supersized wombat. It got yeah. like 4,000 pounds. Jeez, like a little truck. A couple of the smaller ancient extinct wombats had... They weren't antlers, true antlers by definition, but they had protuberances on their head that looked like antlers. Oh, ah, protuberances. My uh, favorite word. So crazy thing is, in even modern time, the last Australian brush fires, like just a couple years ago, they seen a couple of these antlered wombats... Like size of small trucks or like uh, four wheelers and stuff, running with all the other animals to get away from the brush fires. Yeah, so they think they're, that they are from the rainforest and they live so deep that we just don't ever see them. See them, right? Yeah. And this is one of those weird things where people think some people think it's a hoax. Some but some biologists think it's just uh, a wombat cousin that's so remote and so rare that we just don't see them, and they're almost always just seen around fires. Because you know, that's the only sense. time they it's come getting out. Pushed out. What if two? What if it's like an ancient? Uh, What's the word? Like gene or an ancient uh, trait Sorry. that gets, you know, every now and then, every so generations, it still comes out like the antlered or the... Does that happen in animals much? Uh, not really, right? N- not really. People think like... Uh, so like albinoism can... Right. Be, so, so sometimes in whales, we think it's connected to gigantism too. Mm, okay. Which if you're already the biggest animal ever... Yeah. You get really big. Right, right. And, the, and you also get highly aggressive... Uh, as far as I know, antlers could be one, but I don't. I can't think of an example off the top of my head. The jackalope. I mean, yes, sure. <laughs> my last one is giant snakes. 
of Australia. We did yeah. Giant Snake several times on this podcast, but... Yep. Never did Australia, did we? No. The Australian ones are weird. Uh, you don't find them a lot. I think a lot of them could be Megalania sightings. The giant... Just seeing lizards. the tail. Seen pieces of them. Yeah. And they... Because their head can be very snake-like. and their, their, their body is very long and, you know... So, I could see that. All right. So, that's what I have for monsters. Now, let's start wrapping up the episode. All right. So, what's going on? I have... I don't... I didn't do my normal thing where I have 18,000 possibilities for you. Right. I got two. Two? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, just what I, you know, just that these areas, like I said at the beginning, are just so under-researched that most of these paranormal or cryptozoological things are just rare animals and mysteries that have been made more mysterious due to not being able to go into most of these parts of Australian rainforest. Yeah. And plus the absolute massive size of this country slash continent with the very limited amount of people that live in this country may make the perfect conditions for a lot of cryptids, as in the animal definition of cryptid, mm -hmm. to exist in one place. Because mm -hmm. we have the idea that why, how can so many cryptids that just listed exist in one place? Right. It's a continent. Right. That no one's venturing into. But 19% is rainforest. Right. That's probably a hundred percent or ninety percent unexplored. More ninety nine. Ninety nine percent. I'm going to say it's massive. We yeah, go on the huge. edges. If you watch where these trails are, they're on the edges. Yeah. Because if you go too far in, you're just not coming back. Right. Yeah. The forest consumes you. And in the outback, like they're, they're, yeah. you will die in the outback. Right. Yeah. The Aborigines are the only people on the earth that can live out there. And crocodile Dundee. He will die in the outback after a certain period of time. Well, no, he lived with the Abor. He learned from them. Oh yeah. So. <laughs> That's my first kind of thought. What do you think about this one? It's just kind of like I think this connection doesn't really exist more. There's no supernatural connection here. It's just that it's a rainforest that's unresearched, oh. and there's animals that live there. 100%. That. Yeah, that's it. I mean, that's it. Not like that's it entirely, but that's true. I believe that's true. I believe 100% that's true. Okay. This next one's probably my favorite. Okay. They always are. The last ones always are. Fern Gully Theory. There are natural magic slash paranormal areas that are or used to exist all over the planet. We call them window areas most of the time, where things like the Fae, Bigfoot, Mothman, Lake Monsters, and all of it, also having heavy abundance of natural wildlife and plant life like rainforests are supposed to have. Basically what I'm getting at is that this isn't the uncommon one. This is just maybe the last one. Right, yeah. That rainforests specifically have a certain side of the paranormal or magic is not the right word. I don't like that word for this kind of stuff, but this power of life that flows out of them. It's both everything from the natural abundance. Like we talked about, these rainforests have the ancient plants and right. animals, but they also are safe havens or producers of paranormal animals like Mothman and Bigfoot and link monsters like the Bunyip and the Fae. And that's why you see the will of the wisp there. And then this is more of what life is supposed to be like, and this just happens to be the last one. Now, let me talk more about that. Is the problem is the the abundance of plant life and animal life are like rainforest supposed to, but due to pollution, deforestation, deep earth mining, fracking, is killing or has killed both natural and supernatural wildlife on most of the planet. I am the big believer that the paranormal is endangered as a whole. I we yeah. don't see werewolves anymore as commonly. Because I think we've killed most of them. Dragons, you know, we've wiped them out. Like, they're still there, just on the fringes, mm -hmm. but they're endangered. Whether they're paranormal or not, it's not the question. I think they're highly endangered. And I think stuff like the Amazon, you know, we've cut down X percentage of it at this point, and the rest of it's so been destroyed and distraught. Mm -hmm. And that they're supposed to be. I think that there's these areas. I don't think it's caused by the Fae. I think the Fae are another symptom of just overwhelming abundance of life. That stuff like dinosaurs may be coming back, like whether it's portals or whatever, but prehistoric life's here. And then high abundance of natural life and animals, high abundance of these crazy varieties of species. Like I said, most of the rainforests in Australia have 75% endemic life. They're yeah. not found anywhere else on the planet. Right. And I think this is, this is the natural order or the natural kind of wonderment of Earth. And we've killed it. We've killed it in other places. We've killed it in these areas, get smaller. And smaller. and smaller and smaller. Yeah. And that's why the Fae in North America and the Fae in Europe are so aggressive. 
because they're, they're protecting what little they have left. It's like it's like getting a cornering a badger, you know. Well, like when we had the girls on from the Cobb podcast, you know, and the Faye got really aggressive, but yeah. they're losing their homes. I really think they're tied to right. the earth in some way, shape, or form, whether they're a m- immune system, whatever. But that's what I think is going on. What do you think about that kind of theory overall? No, I like it, and uh, I, you know, I think, uh, you know. Maybe humans truly are the creators of this world around us. You know, your mind really creates the world around you. God is the creator. So. Well, you know what I mean. We, we, uh, not, yeah, I didn't mean, I guess, creator, but we manipulate the world no, around us. No blasphemy on this podcast. Right. Yeah, there's no room for it. Um, we, we, our minds manipulate the world around us. So when we get so, uh, you know, urbanized, technologically quote unquote advanced it locks your mind into only thinking or believing things are a certain way so when you get into these areas that i guess that way of thinking does not yet exist it allows for these natural ways the way like you said life's meant to be to flourish still and that's why all this weird stuff you know in quotes weird may just be normal this is how things are supposed to be. But now it's all like focused in one small area. So it's like extra weird and extra crazy because it doesn't fit the mold of what we're taught to believe the earth's supposed to be now. I agree with you except the beginning of your statement. Which is? I don't think we are creating the world around us. I think we're ignoring the world around us. I think we're a, a cog, a part of this machine. I think that's how we were designed to yeah. be. And I think we're ignoring it to benefit ourselves. But are so, we benefiting ourselves? No. Or do we the short, think we are? The short. Yeah. You screw your gener- you screw your kids to benefit now. Kind right, of like right, right, what right. What we're doing with the earth and whether you believe in global warming or not doesn't matter. No, but I do, don't. I'm saying at home. <laughs> okay. The, but the, we are killing the environment as a whole. We are the deep earth yeah. mining and all the fracking and the the earth is the way that we can live on the earth is dying. Oh yeah. Life will always bounce back in some way, shape, or form. But the way that our habitat, the way we need to live on the earth is mm-hmm. dying. And I think that this is just probably the last bit of the truly wonderful rainforest. And I'm not saying anything about the Amazon's still gorgeous in areas. But we've talked about there's so many illegal minings and strip mines and killing of whole villages. Fortopia. And, yeah, Fortopia, which is a whole – that's an episode. That will be an episode someday. <laughs> uh where the Amazon is beat up pretty bad. Oh, yeah. And the Amazon is a manufactured partly rainforest. Yeah. Uh, and then some of the others, you know, the Sumatra rainforest have been clear cut so dramatically. And, you know, so a lot of the other rainforests on the planet are dead. And is, uh, is that or beat up by design? S- yes, no. I think it's just a part of when humans made the decision as a species. And by humans, you mean... Uh- the humans that run the major corporations. That no, I think it rule started. Everything. No, I think it started way before that. Oh yeah, I, guess. I think it started way before that, and we just kept we made a system where those those type of humans can exist. Mm-hmm. Or maybe they made the system so they can f- I continue think, to exist. No, I think it's the exact opposite because I think humans know, be- as a whole. Well, before you know, we had kings and whatnot and rulers. It was always there was always classes. But humans, as a species, decided to step away from nature and the natural world. We were forced to. We were not forced to. Yeah. We when they have these start amazing, putting us in suits and civilized you're societies. You're thinking very newish. I'm thinking very oldish. Well, yeah. So well, but when we were cavemen, like our living learned, off the land, like Native Americans. Probably the most advanced version of it, right? Living off the land, following the fish. That's how it's supposed to be. That's what I'm saying. And humans stepped away from that as a species. Right. By force. No, it wasn't by force. Uh, Are you kidding me? Native Americans, for example. No, the Native Americans were moved by force. See? that was a little, I'm talking as the species did it a long time ago. It's just That was just the latest version. Okay. So this story <laughs> does have a sad ending. Oh, no. Uh these wonderful paranormal forests may not be with us much longer. Unfortunately. Australia, so my next, my last article for the episode. Australia's tropical rainforest trees are dying at double the rate Ooh. of any other trees on the planet. Ooh, that's not good. Uh, and it started since the 1980s, seemingly because of 
events like global heating, uh, but it's affected the rain systems so dramatically. New research has rose in concerns that tropical rainforests could start to release carbon dioxide they've been absorbing. So what's happening is carbon, you know, whether you think global warming is real or not, but carbon dioxide is can be a problem, especially for our oceans. Uh, and carbon dioxide sumps is what they're called, are mm-hmm. very important environments. Like, for example, whales are a good example because they lock so much carbon in their massive bodies. Mm-hmm. And then when they die, it goes to the ocean floor, right. which gets relocked. Uh, rainforests are another great example of carbon locking systems. Uh, these rainforests are starting to revert. The Australian rainforests are starting to die in weird ways we've never seen before. And we're not really mm. sure why. Probably spraying stuff over it, them. And it, I think it's more of a paranormal answer. Or that, that the earth as a whole has been beaten up so bad that she's starting to lose. Mm. So let me read, keep reading. The published, this journal this study was published in the Journal of Nature. Uh, found the average lifespan of trees in northern Queensland have been reduced by about half in the last 30 years. Hmm. Trees are dying twice as early as they normally they don't reproduce as much. They're finding consistently across all different species of trees in the rainforest. Hmm. So it's literally, it's like a sickness. And it's very much like Fern Gully, where this giant pollution monster, essentially, you know, the, the personification right. of Earth's pollution is just affecting it as a whole that we don't understand. So scientists said this is an uh, indirect natural system, such as the rainforest may have already been responding to climate problems for decades and struggling, and to suggest other rainforests across the globe may be experiencing similar rise in death rates. Uh, David Brunnerman, a tropical rainforest ecologist from the University of Oxford, has studied the lead and the lead author in this study, so that he's shocked to detect such a mark and in increased tree mortality. So eat there. What was that guy's name again? Uh, David Bunnerman, B A U M A N. So the Oxford professor. Um, okay, I'm not going to say that. His name is Yavurdo Malayan, the co-author of this study, compared the uh, change in Australia's rainforest to those in the coral reefs and the Great Barrier Reef, that have suffered massive bleaching events in the past seven years. It's likely the driving factor we have identified the increased dying power of the atmosphere caused by global concerns. Suggests similar increase in tree death rates may be occurring across the world's tropical rainforest. So basically, this study goes into that they're watching their forest in Australia okay. die at twice as fast rates. Okay. And they're freaking out about the Australian rainforest, but they're also saying, everybody else, pay attention to your rainforest because it's probably happening to all your rainforest, but everybody else's rainforest are getting logged so fast, nobody can tell. Right, yeah. So he's like, you, you don't realize it's going to be dying on both ends. That You're burning both ends of the candle? Yeah. And we're going to be out of trees way faster, these massive amounts of trees way faster. So this study was, uh, they did 24 northern Queensland uh, rainforest with over 10,000 trees in the study. Okay. So that's just tons of data. That's a lot of data samples as far as biological study. Uh, But the lab was focusing on tropical rainforest specifically. But yeah, just basically that these rainforests are dying a lot, a lot faster. And that they seem to be releasing carbon as a, a stressor that they are trying to respirate like us because they're having trouble breathing the natural way. Hmm. They're just, they're struggling. We're not really sure why. And it's like biology is kind of in this tailspin to where the biologists that care don't have any funding and the biologists that are being paid by big corporations are lying. Right. So it's just like... Which one does this biologist fall under? I think they don't have funding because they, this is the study and they have, they're still trying to get another study going. They're trying to get funding to do it. Uh, but they're, because at the end of the study, they're suggesting that we need to pretty much abandon all this clear cuttings types. I agree with forest. that. So yeah, they're not getting any money. Yeah, because there's lumber is one of the like the third biggest legal industry in the world. Right. Yeah, which is craziness. But we just. Uh, so yeah. I would like to read one more thing before we discuss. And this is from Dr. Seuss. Unless someone like you cares an awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And that's from the Lorax said about the deforestation. Ah. Oh. Uh, because it's just weird that humans have this huge disconnect yeah. with forest specifically yeah. with life and forests are the lifeblood of the planet, whether it's oxygen or carbon, whatever you want to say, but they hold the land together. They re the soil. They do all these crazy things mm-hmm. and we are just clear cutting them. We just have it so a, fast. We have a disconnect with the natural world anymore. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I think that this study is showing 
And it's, you know, they're, they're begging for more more universities and more people to go out and test their rainforest. Yeah. Because they're begging people, like, this is probably, they're just, the whole point of this article is that this is the global concern that nobody's taking seriously besides right. in Australia. And Australia is known for, you know, hyper caring for other wildlife, as, you know, as far as any country, or mm-hmm. they've almost gone to war over some things with whales. Right. Uh, so, yeah, that's just kind of the thought. Here's my thought. I, th- I think it's uh, – I think the big problem is deforestation, clear-cutting, just r- basically raping the earth for its resources and not giving back, not restoring. And I think it's – the the blame is being cast on, like, uh, you know, global warming, like this big fear. Like, we all need to change what we're doing to fix this problem when I think the real problem is, you know, corporate, you know – use of resources and destroying them all, you know, taking and not giving back. Um, I think that's the big problem is uh, using our resources in such a an abundant way for mass production of everything and um, for the use of, you know, may not benefit the whole, like everybody as well as it's benefiting the people who are doing all this deforestation stealing all the water from the world, you know, um, stealing all those natural resources. I think that's the big problem, but they make this other blame like the, how we're the problem. We're the ones causing it. See what I don't like fully about that thought. Cause I'm with you for most of it is that it excuses the individual. Cause we all do stuff that impacts the environment. Sure. But it is, you know, definitely, you know, corporations do more by, right. by milestones. And I think, I think what we do as individuals Matters. The, it matters, yes, but I think the Earth would. It's meant for us. We're meant. The Earth's meant for human beings to use it, but, but not on that corporate like. In, in mass. the Bible, it talks about we are the caretakers, right, of this planet, right, not to just use, right, to take care of. And I think we've forgotten that last step. Oh, hundred percent. But by the by the by the lives we have, been, or like the the lifestyles that we're living in now that we're kind of not forced to live in, but kind of forced to live in just here's the thing. It seems natural to us now. Corporations will change to whatever the consumer demands. Yes. A hundred percent. And I think so not putting corporations aren't real as far as thinking entities, they will do whatever they're like more and more like a fungus. Yeah. They will do and consume whatever they're allowed the easiest way possible. Right. So unless us as a people Mm -hmm. put those constraints on them. For sure. They, the second we put those constraints on, they're going to conform. For sure. And I've seen it working in biology that the second that there's locals that care. Yeah. They will follow the constraints because it's, it's not worth the headache. And that's where I think the problem is with them now is they, they've learned the way to manipulate us to not want to change to where we almost accept the ways they present to us as being the only way, you know? See, I don't even think it's that. I just think people don't connect. They don't see trees anymore. They don't see wildlife right. dying. They don't see pollution events. Through, and I think it's because- I've waited through it's... thousands of dead fish and salamanders yeah. because one company got careless one day. Right, yeah. And But they hide that. You know, they hide that from the public. They hide all it, that. Is it them hiding it, or is it the public wanting not to see it? Well- I mean, it can be both. Yes. I think they, see, I think they manipulate us into not wanting to see it. They manipulate us into how we think. I, I think it's human nature. To what? Avoid trauma. And that's trauma. Yeah, right. And I think And maybe that's what they're using. You know, they're using our own human nature against us. But I just don't, I, it's not 100% that, and it's not 100% what I'm saying either. I think, like yeah. you said, it's both. Yeah. So, like I said, the Dr. Seuss quote is the perfect example it for is, what yeah. you need to do. It's once, Unless it's someone like you. Uh-huh who cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And I've seen individuals make changes for hundreds of miles of river systems. Yeah. Individual people. Right. Because they cared so much and they never gave up the fight. And eventually corporations bend, you know, they bent down for them. Bend at the knee. They did. Yeah. Because it was just, it got to be so much. And they, this one, um, I'll say his last name because it's an awesome last name, but it's, his last name's McCracken. Uh, Ernie McCracken. <laughs> You almost said his real name, though. I got nervous. <laughs> That's uh, from the movie Kingpin. Uh, Bowling reference. Uh, but he 
cared so much about these systems, and he fought forever against giant corporations, mm-hmm. decades. Mm-hmm. And recently, he's won. Yeah, and they've cleaned up, and they're still, te- you know, you Good. still got to. But so it's yeah, it's corporations do produce tons and tons of more pollution than we do, but they're only doing that because the citizens are allowing them to do that. Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And until us citizens or everyday normal people, majority of the world, um, become a, like self-aware or aware enough that they hold the actual power, you know, until that happens, I don't, you know, nothing will really change. No, nope. you got to realize it's you. Yeah. It's you as the everyday person can make changes. You, you know, there's tons and tons. Be the change you, you seek. See the world. Care. I mean, it's. It's almost selfish. Care it, you caring for the planet is caring for yourself. It's caring for your kids. Yep. And I think that that's the thing with oh, what's the what's the industrial generation here in the U.S. They're they're still alive. Industrial generation. It's the boomers is that what it is, or what's the one before the boomers? I don't know how they they lump all these in the I different can't names remember. And... But they you can say it was ignorance, but they were the ones that kind of started this whole chain of industrialization and using of massive amounts of chemicals yeah. and stuff through you know and that's the way they were raised you know it's but the way they were taught as being the okay way they were raised because their parents never had that right no that was the exactly jump from it's just we like, use farmland it's and like, that's okay to now we are mining trees for rubber right and burning down rainforests to make paper i mean if you compare it to like now at modern times you know specifically just today the kids raised today, you know, have all cell phones, technology, and videos that they have access to at the tips of their fingers where, you know, as just us, we didn't have that growing up. You know, it's completely different. So, you know, imagine those boomers growing up, they have access to all this new... And I don't know if it was the boomers. I know we have a lot of listeners of all age right. groups. I don't, I don't know, yeah. I'm just saying that as a culture, right. that was kind of when the culture started eating resources much faster rates just, of stuff the previous generation... Just didn't understand. Didn't, exactly. And just like us now, you know. And then they fully didn't understand the consequences of doing that. Right. And even like now, we don't understand the consequences that these kids being having access to all this stuff, what it's going to lead to. I do got to say, there's one, I got to apologize for the state. I believe it's Wyoming because they won't be with us much longer. <laughs> what? Yeah. Why? So I was, this has been my biological rant episode. Okay. Uh, as a as an ecologist, uh, basically, they so you know deep rare earth elements mm-hmm. like stuff for computers and stuff. Oh no, they found it in Wyoming. Well, let me finish my statement. Oh no. So China has now. I'm gonna I'm gonna get the numbers wrong, but China has been the biggest producer of it, uh, for decades. Mm-hmm. As and they've been mining it because it's super rare to find near the surface of the earth. So it's super rare. China has a bunch of nodes of it that's close. Okay. Let's say they've harvested a total of 8 billion pounds. Okay. And the total they've been doing it. You're right. And we've de- we've never had a deposit of it in the U.S. It's either Wyoming. I think it's Wyoming. Uh, it's one of those states out there. Wyoming, Montana. I think it's like Wyoming. I'm pretty Idaho. sure. But they discovered a node that is eight, like 80 trillion tons. Oh, yeah. A thousand yep. times bigger than China's ever harvested. So China will probably be in here in our country, and we'll sell them all that and stuff. I'm and I'm not saying the U.S. government had anything to do with this, but I think farmers have already started disappearing. Oh, okay. Not shocked. Because they have land that happens to have rare earth elements under them. And our government needs it. It feeds off it because they can make a profit off it. Well, it's, oh, it's yes. been China, one of China's biggest exports to the U.S. as far as financially. Um, money. Oh, I just need more money. So if you're listening to us, I believe it's Wyoming. Uh, why don't you move? No, stand firm. Stand firm. This is the change we need. I'll join you. Don't, don't, don't do it. Uh, listen, a, everyone. Move to Wyoming. Like I said, Farmers are already disappearing. They can't kill all of us. They can. Move to Wyoming, everyone. Like, Abandon your cities. Move to Wyoming. And that's that's one of those states they could just like release viruses in and watch <laughs> oh everybody melt. Gosh. Well, just, just stop. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't what, say that. You're going to manifest it. No, that's what the government does. We know they've done it. I know, but we can stop it. We can stop them. We need to retake. If you would like to go, well, like I said, our Wyoming listeners, I will help you find an apartment in Ohio. No, we, we, we abandon your apartments in Ohio. Move to Wyoming. 
But I was watching one video of a farmer that, like, they just found this stuff. And I think it was LiDAR is how they kind of found it. Mm. Uh, and I think he was, he sold so fast because I think he was given a really big check and had a gun pointed at him kind of deal. Yeah. And he's like, Man. yeah, you know what? I'll leave my four generations cattle farm. Yeah, it's awful. All right. So remember, I'll read it one more time. <laughs> Disgusting. Unless someone like you, who cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Bye. Bye. Hey, guys. Thank you for listening to Crib is the Corn Podcast. Remember, the best way to support the show is share it with a friend. But if you are craving more of the J clones and more from Mr. E, there's always extra content on Patreon and our paid member space on cryptidsofthecorn.com. We'll catch you next time with more exciting, fun, and informative information. Bye! Bye.